Okay, thank you all for joining us. And we're gonna just wait another minute or maybe I'll kind of get started gently uh, just as wait for the last few people to stream in. You can see them all arriving now. Okay, great. Um, cool, so time is money as they say. <laughs> I don't know if that joke is funny at all when you hear it from a lawyer, but um, we're different lawyers. So let me just, for the people that are new to legalese or new to these webinars, let me just do a bit of an introduction. Um, my name is Eitan Stern. I'm a commercial and entertainment lawyer. I'm the director of legalese. Um, I have the real pleasure of uh, doing a lot of work around the creative and tech industry. And I've been doing this for kind of a couple of years now. Um, just a little bit about legalese. So Legalese is what we call a creative legal agency, although largely we made up the term. We are lawyers and that specialize in the tech and the creative industry. And on our team, we've got um, lawyers of all different types. We've got commercial lawyers, uh, entertainment, IP, regulations, labor. We very much pride ourselves in being a one-stop shop for the creative and tech industry. So for um, a lot of the businesses or, or entrepreneurs that we have joining us today. Um, very company culture focused companies. That's some of the images and, and things from the team. And just so you know, this webinar fits as one webinar in a series. We've kind of start, we started around the pandemic or at the beginning of the pandemic, and we've kind of had going for almost two years now. So once a month, we do a webinar on a really interesting topic. Um, if you go to our YouTube channel or to our blog, you can find all the topics there. Um, yeah. We have an hour, but I'm going to try to keep this short and snappy because uh, as beautiful as webinars are, I'm sure everyone's got other things to do. So we're going to make this quick and impactful, and I'm going to leave time for questions at the end. So what we're here to do today is talk about shareholders agreements, right? Um, as I said, I've been doing this job. I've been a lawyer for almost 10 years. I've seen a lot of companies and heard a lot of stories. Consistently, the issue that I've seen pop up I don't want to say it's the biggest issue that we see, but it's the most consistent thing that we see across companies from all sectors and all stages of their company is that one of the things that crops up is shareholder issues, right? Um, and so, and when I say it's an issue that crops up, it's an issue that I've seen companies experience and an issue that can lead to real big problems within a company. And that can be all types of companies. And why do I say it's the most consistent issue? <coughs> Excuse me. So firstly, there's that old saying that investors invest in people and not uh, 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 people in teams and not ideas. And I really believe that's true. If you're a company that's looking to attract investment at any point, the, it doesn't matter how good your product, are, your product is or your business is. But when investors are looking at your business, they are looking at the team that's running it. One of the things that helps keep that keeps a healthy shareholder team or founder team is a strong shareholders agreement. There are lots of stats around why teams of multiple people are more investable than single people but what's for sure is that a team with a strong a business with a strong founder team is a more investable company um secondly <coughs> oh excuse me secondly shareholder issues is one of the biggest reasons that we see companies fall apart and the examples are really endless when it comes to early stage uh, uh founders um, often you see the founders may not work together well, or there's going to be issues, and that's fine. What we're talking about today is not how you run a company with no founder issues. We're talking about how you manage that. Secondly, founders might not be aligned with the vision of the business, and creating a shareholders agreement is a really good way to, to facilitate that. But founder issues and misalignments is a big reason that we see early stage companies um, falter. Secondly, as I've mentioned, there's issues with funders. Where if you're looking for funding, um, at any point, if your terms with the founding team or the founders is not clear, your business has serious issues with being investable. And thirdly, when we look at bigger businesses, <coughs> oh, excuse me, I've got a bit of a frog in my throat today. When we look at bigger businesses, growing businesses, even corporate-sized businesses, corporate governance issues keep cropping up. And what we're going to look at today is how is not how we avoid them altogether, but how we create structure to avoid corporate governance issues cropping up. Really, the examples are endless. Um, we at Legally have dealt with over 5,000 clients. I've seen many stories about invest, uh, shareholder issues, and we've seen many ways to, to, uh, to fix them. Some of the bigger examples that you probably have heard of, WeWork, 
Um, I just watched the We Crash docu uh, well, documentary, a hardware documentary, the We Crash series, um, brilliant, really entertaining. But a large part of that idea was that there was a shareholder misalignment between the shareholder and the investors. Um, and once you dug into it, those terms weren't clear enough or, or, or the investors hadn't secured the terms close enough. Of course, there's the famous Facebook story. We all watched the movie, you know, that is a founder at one of the biggest companies on the planet that really landed up in trouble with his own company. Why? Because he was working on an aspect of trust around the founders, a founding team and not with the shareholders agreements. So kind of my last intro point is one of the things that we need that you need to do when you're working on a business with another person, doesn't matter who that person is, is you got to make sure that there's a strong shareholders agreement in place. We're going to look into why. So the next question, I suppose, is, does my business really need a shareholders agreement? Um, and I, I've always liked that quote by, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I've always liked that quote by, by Oprah Winfrey, who says, as soon as there are, as soon as there's more than one person in the room, there are, is more than one opinion in the room. So, um, you know, it's a really interesting thing to think about when you're running a business. You you you've got many different opinions to think about, and really, uh, that, so in answering, does my business need a shareholders agreement? I have heard all of the excuses in the world. I want to quickly debunk some of them. The first thing we hear a lot is, "No, we're family. You know, we're not going to land up fighting. We trust each other." And to that, I say, so then you would be the first family in history to land up in a family fight over money or over business. So certainly, I mean, if you if, you know, I. The, the blurb for this webinar said, don't, people say don't do fam business with family. I just say don't do business with family if you don't have a good shareholders agreement. The second excuse that we hear a lot is we don't need one. We're too small. We, you know, it's just a small business. We, we, we haven't grown to the point yet of needing one. Um, to that as well, like, you know, I, I think that when you're small is exactly when you want to, to kind of engage with these issues. As soon as you're bigger, there's more to fight about. Um, and you you lose that veil of ignorance, so you lose the the idea of creating sh uh, shareholder terms before you have all this business going on. Um, secondly, if if there are any early stage founders over here, one of the spoilers is that running a business does get more difficult, and things do get busier as you go. Um, so you know one of the the times to kind of nail down these terms because it does become less and less of a priority for you in your day to day is at the beginning. The other thing we hear a lot of is nothing's gone wrong up until this point. You know, why do we need a share agreement? Everything's been fine. And that's fantastic. But history is not a very good way to predict the future, as any investment firm will tell you. At some point, you're going to have a shareholder disagreement, and it is going to be a lot easier to solve if you have proper agreements and structures in place. Um, otherwise, you, uh, otherwise, it's got a higher chance of turning into a big deal. The last theory that I want to debunk is one we also hear all too often, which is, well, we're going to raise money soon. So we don't need a shareholders agreement now. We um, we we don't need one now because at some point, once we get the investors coming in, we're going to have to relook at all of this. And I could not agree less with that statement. If you're going, uh, it's going to be a rough ride in agreeing to ter agreeing to terms with investors. If you're looking for that, the last thing that you need is not being on the same page with your co-founder or not having that sorted. So, for sure, if you're looking to raise investment, you know, before you add a couple more people in the room who are not friends and family and don't know you personally um, and do not have the emotional attachment to you, you really need to kind of secure your founder terms before you start raising investments. I cannot stress that anymore if I tried. So from my side, uh, you need a shareholders agreement. Um, but I think a lot of the stuff I've kind of mentioned here is more like the personal stuff, but it's also, you know, there's a big technical aspect to this as well, which I just want to touch on briefly. Um, the technical aspect is that a shareholders agreement is important because whether you like it or not, if you're running a business with someone else, you are bound by certain rules. A lot of those rules are contained in the Companies Act, but in the corporate laws of South Africa, there are rules in general. And you need, as a founder, to interact with these rules. You need to understand what they are, which you can, what you can change and what you can't change. And a lot of the process of compiling a shareholders agreement is going through just that. It's understanding exactly that. So that is, uh, you know, so the Companies Act really is really important. The next thing here is that if you're raising capital, I've mentioned this a couple of times, 
as soon as you've got capital from anyone else or, or uh, you suddenly have commitments to those people and those people have rights. So, and these obligations and rights are best recorded in a shareholders agreement. So if you're one of those founders that's taken angel capital for maybe family or friends, it should be a massive red flag um, because you have a, a better chance of things working out and having clarity for your investors if you have those talk terms uh, ironed out. The last thing, as I keep mentioning, is clarity. Uh, shareholder terms don't need to be, um, this doesn't need to be a, an issue that you're constantly working on, um, but not having this worked out can really take away your focus because if you keep having to deal with shareholder disputes, it's just going to lead for may be a difficult business to run. The idea is for you to have clarity with your partners and your shareholders, uh, your founders, on how this business is going to be run. And what I'm going to keep digging into today is this document that we're talking about is part of it is a formality, right? Part of it is a document you're going to put on the shelf and hopefully never look at again, right? But the value in going through this process is not just having the documents. It is the process itself. Having the discussions, ironing out the terms, creating the, the obligations and expectations of one another is exactly what makes a strong shareholder or partner team or founder team and therefore creates a stronger business. So really the, 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 the important thing over here is the discussion and having clarity amongst the partners. So practically, how does this work? Okay. Um, I just want to cover some of this before we really jump into the meat of it, like what goes into the shareholders agreement. But I want to just kind of clarify a couple of the uh, uh, issues. Firstly, well, for context, firstly, what actually is a shareholders agreement? So what it is, it's a document that outlines the terms of the shareholder relationship. So the different founders, whether that's founding partners, whether that's investors, anyone who owns equity in the business, this is a document which outlines the terms of, of their rights and what they can expect of one another. It does not have to be a document that is too technical, which we'll go into in a bit, but it needs to take into account actual company law. So while you can include all the elements of your shareholder, uh, so while, while you can include all the elements of your shareholder relationship, you... Uh, which, you know, the different things that you've agreed on, you also have to stick to some rules in this. And that's, well, well that's, that's the rules that's contained in the, in the Companies Act. So it's a document for you and your partners, which speaks to South African law, but helps you manage your relationship. Next point is how does a shareholders agreement interact with your MOI? We're not going to dig too much into MOIs today, memorandum of incorporations, but I do need to mention them. So every company in South Africa, so you don't need a shareholders agreement according to law, but you do need an MOI. And every single company that's registered in South Africa automatically gets a standard MOI from SIPSI. So South African corporate law is actually phenomenal and really progressive. It makes it really uh, easy to register businesses and get businesses running. It gives you a legal framework to operate in. If you try to register a business somewhere in Europe, in, in Spain, in Amsterdam, in England, which we do for our clients, I can tell you it is not the same. It can be an expensive and arduous process to register a company in South Africa. It's not the case. You automatically get a memorandum of incorporation. We call them standard MOIs. And you have the Companies Act, which really creates a legal framework for uh, shareholder relationships and for a company. Um, and but and so so these are these do are documents that's that kind of stand in the place if you don't have a shareholders agreement and they really deal with some of the nitty gritty aspects of running a company quorum for meeting shareholders votes minority rights directors decisions that sort of stuff the other thing that's really important to know about mois is they actually take precedent over a shareholders agreement so if there's a contradiction between your moi which is an automatic document which you get you can update it yourself and your shareholders agreement, if there's a contradiction, your MOI takes precedent. So you do have to read those two documents in line with each other. So when we draft shareholders agreements, it's really important for us to make sure that we don't put anything in there which contradicts the MOI. But some people might be asking, well, Eitan, if the MOI takes precedence and you automatically get it, why don't you just keep the MOI? Why all the shareholders agreement stuff? You know, and, so, so, and I think the answer to that, so there's a couple of answers around why, why you don't just keep your MOI or why you don't just amend your MOI. And I think for me, the main thing is that a shareholders agreement is a much less technical document, right? 
the aim of the shareholders agreement is to manage the shareholder relationship where the aim of the MOI is to manage corporate governance as a whole. Now, as a smaller business, and I don't mean smaller business because I know that not everyone today is running a small shop. We've got some big business owners and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, people working in bigger businesses on this call. By smaller, I don't just mean small in terms of revenue or size. I mean small in terms of complexity, right? If you have less shareholders in a business, you don't have a complex board structure, you don't have a complex company to run. Then the most important thing from my perspective is not ironing our quorum for meetings, because the most time, you know, meetings are going to happen, you know, electronically or, or, or just in the office. It's not about that. It's about ironing out some of the things that you would not necessarily find in an MOI, and which we're going to go into some of that stuff. So, you know, I think that, so that's one reason. I think the MOI, the one idea of the shareholders agreements, you can keep it a lot simpler than you can keep your MOI. Secondly, shareholders agreements are private right? They're private documents. You don't need to lodge them, whereas, whereas MOIs need to be lodged at SIPSI. Now, if you're making small updates to your shareholder relationships, adding shareholders, changing your equity, if you've got a vesting schedule, for an example, each time something happens, you need to be re-lodging your MOI, which is an admin burden, and, and inevitably, you're not going to land up doing it, unless you come onto our company's secretarial product, in which case we'll do it for you. But um, Essentially, you know, it, it, it's a private document, so you can have things in there which you wouldn't necessarily want the public to know. Obviously, nothing illicit, but you know, stuff that you want to keep private, right? Um, and that's kind of a, ma a, a main, the main reasons. You're not going to be, you don't need to lodge the shareholders agreement every time you edit it, and it's private. Whereas the MOI, anyone can pay a fee and go view your MOI. It's a public document. So one of our preferred methods is really to hammer down on the, the shareholders agreement for new companies or, or companies that are not that complex. And when you get to a point that you really need that complex corporate governance, we'll mend your MOI to a specific MOI, we'll make it relate to the shareholders agreement, and that will be your corporate governance structure. Um, and I suppose the net last point just to consider here is a shareholders agreement lodged with SIPSI. I've said it, but I'm really going to hammer that home. No, it's a private document. It's not lodged with SIPSI. Um, and I think that really gives us an opportunity to get creative with this document, with the shareholders agreements and put the real relevant stuff in there, which is exactly what I want to look at with everyone today. Right. I don't know if we've got questions. I can't see the thingy. It does, it's not coming up for me. Let's see if I can make it come up. No. Okay. What I'll do is at the end, I'm going to get to questions when I can. I'm too scared to touch anything and ruin my share screen. So the next point, and this is really the kind of meat of the whole thing. What goes into a shareholders agreement? Mm. Now, just remember, on a webinar like this, we are speaking very broadly. We're talking general about terms. It's going to be hard for me to design your specific shareholders agreement, but it might give you, well, not might, it certainly is going to give you areas to think about, a broad structure to work on, and a framework in which you can either approach a lawyer or in potentially in certain instances do yourself, but it's going to give you a framework to look at. So I want to look at what actually goes into a shareholders agreement. And this, so this document is going to be a playbook to manage issues in the future. When compiling it, often, you know, everything in your company is fine. There's no big, big issues going on. But what we're trying to do is future-proof your company. We're trying to look into the future and decide rules of how we're going to manage certain aspects of the company. That is what we're doing here. Um, I can't ask for a poll because I can't see the thingy. But my question is, is anyone here married? Um, you can kind of, uh, you know, think about that yourself. Um, is anyone here married? And I don't know if you're married. I said, you know, I certainly remember, know this experience. Um, have you ever had an experience where you, you're in an argument with your partner and even the smallest issues, they seem, you can't resolve the smallest things when there's high tension. Later, when the tension has dropped, everyone's had some personal time. You can find the resolution very, very simply. And that's the idea here. It's really tough, not just in relationships at home, but in business to work out solutions when you are currently involved in a dispute where tensions are high, emotions are high, and people often are not acting rationally. So what do we do at the shareholders agreement? We are providing a playbook on how to manage disputes when they arise. So we don't need to have a fight about something or an argument about how to resolve it. We can look at the playbook and have a system for it. So Firstly, it tells people 
how they are supposed to act. And in my experience, if people just know the rules, they generally keep to them. Secondly, if something goes wrong, it gives us a system on what to do in that instance. So um, your job, wait, before I get to this, your job in compiling a shareholders agreement is really to have those tough discussions. Have the tough discussions that go into building a sustainable business relationship. And I'm going to list some of the main aspects that I think are important when doing this. These are my main bullet points that I work through with, with a client when doing the shareholders agreement. So if your shareholders agreement, if you're compiling one, here are the discussion points that you and your partner need to have. The first thing that you need to get an understanding of is equity. What is equity? Who owns what in the business? That's core to this whole process. You would be blown away by how often this is not understood by founders who've started a business together. It's either not discussed or kind of left to later, but let me guarantee you it's important to have an understanding of because often people don't have, are not on the same page. So, um, you know, so, and the question is who owns what in the company? With that, you're going to be deciding on options. Do people own shares now and have options for more shares later? Is there a vesting schedule? So they only go and get their shares in time. If, for example, you, you have employees that are part of your shares, uh, shareholding group. Are there any clawbacks? Are people allowed to claw back shares um, in certain instances? So the base of this, of this document is we want to understand what shares people own in this company, who owns what equity. Some things to note here, which I think are really important, is that at all times, the whole company needs to be owned. Right. Some people often come and say, listen, we want to keep 10% back or 20% back for an employee share scheme later. Fantastic. It has to be owned by someone now. And then we can find a mechanism for that to be transferred over or diluted at another point. But the main thing is at all time, people need to own the company. The next thing is that ownership is a real right. This is crucial to remember. It cannot be taken away. It can't be fired as a shareholder. You can't just strip someone of their shareholders' rights. You can't take it away. So once you're giving shareholding, it's important to know that that person owns it. It's a real right. It's the same as a house or a car or a MacBook or whatever it is. The last thing is that having shareholder agreements is not quite enough. You need to record your share registry somewhere. So your share registry may change. That is the recording of who owns what in the company. Really crucial to have that maintained somewhere. Again, chat to us. We've got a really cool piece of software that we use to maintain share uh, um, Share, share registries and give everyone share certificates. So chat to us about that. It's our company secretarial product. But closing this off, the main thing that I want everyone to know over here is you need to understand who owns what. The next part over here is that you need to understand. So this is point number two, shareholder roles and responsibilities. Now, this is a little bit unorthodox. And I don't know if you're going to find this in a textbook or if you go to uh, most lawyers, I don't know if they're going to tell you to include this. But one of the things I like to include with founding teams around shareholders agreements is I want them to include their roles and responsibilities in the business. Now, strictly speaking, you should have your shareholders agreements and employment agreements for your founders if they're working in the business. In reality, it's, it's a big ask to get to, for companies to do that, to have full employment agreements because you might not have full job descriptions or salaries, the exact salaries. And then, you know, it's often quite complex how shareholders or founders are, are, are remunerated. Hopefully you're at the point that you get there, but this, so this is a point that's for, for newer businesses, is that you want to include your roles and responsibilities. What can you expect of each of the shareholders? What, can, what are their obligations to the companies, right? That is the benefit in this agreement. If you're not going to do employment agreements, you can include some of that in there. You can also then tie people's shareholding to their roles and responsibilities. So if it's cool, you know, John, you're going to be doing, uh, you're going to be in charge of marketing the company and John doesn't do his marketing chores, then you can have a clause in there to say, well, you didn't, we're going to now force you out of the company and make you sell your equity because you didn't actually do what you promised to. Mm. So equity, number one, roles and responsibilities, number two. The third thing, oopsie days, the third thing that I, that I always think is super important to include is decision making. How are decisions going to be made for this company? Really, really important. If you want to avoid disputes in the future, just come to an arrangement on how you make decisions. Will it be unanimous? 
Will some people have more say than others? Does each shareholder have different areas of the business that you're in charge of? Are you going to flip a coin? It doesn't matter to me. It should matter to you. How are you going to make decisions for this business? Now, what's a really important thing to understand is there are kind of three levels of decision making for a company. First level is your director's decisions. These are the day-to-day -day ordinary decisions of the company. Do you buy red pens or blue pens? Do you hire staff? Do you move offices? Right? Then you get ordinary resolutions. These are your general, also can be day-to-day, -day, but this is, you know, most decisions of direction for the company, right? So if you're going to, so yeah, I mean, it's hard to give examples because this is really going to be everything that's not a special resolution. So the, and you need 50% vote. So decide, if you want to decide, let's say to move offices, if 50% of the shareholders don't want, more than 50% don't want to do it, you're not going to be moving, moving offices. <coughs> And you need, so you need 50% vote for that. The next one is special resolutions. These are your major decisions for the company. Shutting down the company, changing strategic direction, uh, loaning out, selling major assets, doing company loans, that's the firing, uh, changing the cap table of the company, that sort of stuff. This is baked into the Companies Act. You need 75% vote for the company to do that. But the important thing to know is you actually can alter some of these aspects. You can move your percentages up and down a little bit. Um, and you can create other elements of your business where you're saying, listen, for X, Y, or Z, we need special resolutions. So let's say you two founders each own 50-50, the company, in your shareholders agreement, you can have a term which says, we can't hire anyone without special resolution, 75%, or without both shareholders approval. If you don't have that, you are going to be stuck in a deadlock if you have 50-50 shareholding. So that's really important with decision-making. You can bake in the rules around how decisions are going to be made for the company. The next one, I call it money in, money going in. How is the company going to be financed? Anyone who runs a business can tell you businesses need, need money, right? Um, who's putting in that money? Is it being put in as a loan? So which you'll get back at some point or isn't being put in, put in as an investment? So in exchange for equity, right? That needs to be decided. If you don't decide that, one shareholder can put in their money and expect to get it back. The other one shareholder can say, sorry, no, you're not getting that back. That's, that was what you paid for your, for your equity. So it's really, really important to have a clear, how is that money going into the company? And the other thing which you want to make clear here is what happens if this company needs more money, right? What are you going to do? We need a rule to decide what to do because at that point, you're running a business, you're short on cash, you're stressed, you need to have a playbook to the, you, if you're in a situation that then you also are not seeing eye to eye with your shareholder in what you're going to do, you've got a big issue. So one of the things that we would do is we'd prioritize this. We would go down the list. We'd say, number one is you'd look at shareholder loans as an example, and maybe you could put uh, an interest amount there, shareholder loans, which attract an interest if not paid back after two years, right? You could capitalize shares. So you could say, cool, whichever shareholder is going to put in money is going to get more shares. Could be an example, a rough term to include, but it's includable. You could say you're going to go to the bank, you know, and you could say last but not least, if we really can't raise anywhere, we're going to sell shares. Or you can mix up that order. But it's really important to have an idea on what you're going to do if this company needs money, because if you're not the same page, for us to have a document to go back to, to decide what to do, so, so important. Next thing is the money going out of the business, right? We dealt with equity, roles and responsibilities, decision-making, money going in, money coming out, right? Who is getting what money out of this company? Are you getting salaries? Are you only going to take dividends? Is the first money coming out loan repayments? Are the loan repayments equal to each other? So if I've put in a million and you've put in two million, do we get money out at the same rate? Or do you get money out double as fast as I do because you've put in double, right? Lots of different ways to skin this proverbial cat, but we need to be on the same page because when you're talking about getting money out of a company, I can tell you for sure, people are going to want to make sure they are covered. So we need to make sure that we have a system for this. Um, one of the things that you could do with this is you could, for example, have a dividend policy in your shareholders agreements. And you could say at the end of each year, we look at what profits are left in the business and 50% of that at a minimum are retained and 50% are issued as a dividend. Great, now we've got a system. Might not suit your business, 
you know, that's why you need to think about what suits your business, but being clear about what money is coming out is crucial. Dispute resolution. I cannot stress this enough. Mm. You need to have a mechanism in a business to decide how disputes are settled. So I've written a ridiculous term here, a mechanism to decide how disputes are settled to avoid disputes about disputes. I'm telling you it happens. We've dealt with it. You haven't even reached the substance of the matter, the thing you're disputing about, but now you are in a fight to decide what mechanism you're going to use to, to, to resolve this fight. Court cases are litigated over this thing. How, what is the method we're going to use to decide this? One company says, I want this arbit. One party says, I want this arbitrator. Another party says, I want this arbitrator. Now you're going to have to go into arbitration to decide which arbitrator you use. It sounds like something out of um, out of a out of a movie, out of um, um, uh, I forget the book. It's, uh, but it sounds like an absurdity, but it, but it actually happens, right? And I suppose my aim for this always when working with companies is to find a way that companies avoid litigation. Litigation is costly. It's expensive. It takes a long time, and it will surely the shareholder litig the shareholder litigation is almost certainly going to ruin your business. So you could say that you're going to settle this of disputes by a coin toss or by arm wrestling if you want. But the bottom line is that you need a system there. Some of the ideas over here, you can say, firstly, we're going to try and negotiate it out. That doesn't work. We're going to go into mediation, right? So formal mediation to try and sit with someone to help us negotiate it out. You could say you're going to take advice from an industry expert. So you're not going to go to a mediator, but you're going to go to someone who you, but maybe a mentor character or someone in the industry who you really respect and has been there for your business. You could say you're going to go to that person to help you mediate the dispute. Or you could say you're going to go to arbitration and that arbitrator has decision-making power. Now you can never really excuse someone's uh, right to litigate. Someone's always got it, but really some of these alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, mechanisms are very, very effective and successful. Unfortunately, they're not popular enough in South Africa. South Africa has, for some reason, a really aggressive and litigious business culture in certain areas. I'm seeing that changing, certainly around the creative and tech industry, but you know, mediation, um, some of the court, some courts in South Africa are now forcing mediation before they uh, allow you to litigate. I know in England they've had experiments like that, and it works brilliantly. Mediation is a brilliant, brilliant mechanism. So what we want to do in your shareholders' agreement is make sure you have some alternatives to follow, so you don't litigate, and we are, that we agree on those alternatives before, so that you don't land up in a fight about fighting. The last, the last one, yes, the last point for this. So. We've said equity, roles and responsibilities, decision-making, money going in, money going out, disputes, and what happens if someone wants to leave or is forced to leave. Now, you're not entering a, a business uh, with someone so they can take shares and ask you to call them when the dividends start rolling in. You're starting a business with someone or working with someone because you want their input. Now, you need to take into account a couple of things when starting a business with someone or if you started your business years ago and you're working with someone, it's fine. You still need to consider this thing. If you haven't got a shareholders agreement at the start, remember my point at the beginning, just because nothing's gone wrong now, it doesn't mean it's not going to go wrong tomorrow or next year. So certain things you need to take into account. People's priorities change. People don't perform or stop performing, right? So someone might get a job off of someone else, somewhere else, or want to start another business. Or someone might stop performing. So they were brilliant at their job. Now they're a little bit slack and they're not performing. Or maybe you did, you're not reaching the success that you wanted to within the time frame, frame that, you, that you aimed at. So both of you thought it's going to take you know, three years to get there. It's now year four and you're not quite there. There's going to be hard discussions to be had. And we need a system over here. Could also happen that you land up in a dispute with your co-founders, right? Everything's gone fine. Suddenly you, you, you find yourselves at loggerheads. You need a system for what to do if someone wants to leave or is forced to leave the business. Now, it's not a pretty discussion to have in the best of times, but it's certainly uh, harder to have after the fact than before the fact. Now, I know when things are good and when you're working with a business partner or starting a business, it's not a sexy conversation. It's not what you want to have. Again, to the marriage example, when you start a marriage, for most people, you have to have a conversation about what happens if you get divorced. It's called an antinatural agreement. It's not romantic, but it is so beneficial to a relationship. You're discussing 
the realities of what happens if the, if the marriage doesn't work out. And it's the same thing with the business. You can call your shareholders agreement an anti-nuptial agreement for your business. You need to have a playbook to follow when th if things go wrong. Some of the things to consider here, how long is the time commitment that you're expecting from each person for their shares to be earned in full, right? If someone leaves before that time, is there a penalty that they're gonna suffer? Right, do they have to this? So if you've said it's gonna be three years, but someone after two years leaves, you can't take away all their shares, but you know, you take away some of their shares, like how is that gonna work? If someone leaves, what happens to their shares? Practically, what actually happens? Do they give them back? Do they sell them back? Do they sell them back at a penalty? How's that gonna work? Because I tell you, the person leaving is going to want to keep as many shares as possible, and the person staying is going to want to uh, is going to want to take back as many shares as possible. You are not you are have uh, opposing viewpoints or interests at that point. You need a mechanism. Is there a penalty on the value of the shares if they leave too early? How is someone's equity in exchange for money treated as opposed to their sweat sweat equity? So let's say someone gave one year of work and one million rand. Are you going to treat those the exact same when they exit? Right? Maybe that doesn't seem totally fair. You can't take away all their shares. They put in money. Are there preemptive rights for other shareholders? So are, is that shareholder who's leaving allowed to sell their shares to anyone? Can they go to your competitor and sell their shares? Can they put them on the open market? Or do they have to sell them back to the shareholders who are staying? Are there rules around what they can do with those shares? It's really, really important to have that one right. That is a make or break thing for a company. Now, I've given options, not answers. Each company is different and there are lots of circumstances to consider. But what is the same for all companies that there, is that there is a need to consider this before jumping in? Because as I said earlier, shareholding is final. It's written in pen. It's like ownership of an asset. Once someone has it, cannot be taken away. Those are my five, my seven points. Equity, decision-making, roles and responsibilities, money going in, money going out, disputes, and what happens if someone wants to leave. There's obviously more, and there can be more, but that is the main stuff, right? My next point, as we start to wrap this up, do I need a lawyer for this? My advice is always the same around this for all legal documents. Do you need a lawyer for this? Well, it depends what it's worth for you. Right. If you're planning to build a business with longevity, which you can scale, which can attract investors, then for sure you need to do this properly. Right. But if that's not in your aim, and this is a small business and that's you know a side project, yeah, maybe it's not worth like if it's not worth investing that much in. So it's really a question of what it's worth to you. So here are your options as I see it. Firstly, you could do a shareholders agreement yourself. It's fine if it's a small business, if you're starting part-time, etc. But then, you know, don't but then you know. If you do decide to scale, you can expect issues. And I think it's, you know, like at home, you might be happy to DIY a pot plant around your house, but you're not going to want to DIY your own home electrics. So really do it yourself, but that's if this business is not a serious one, which some businesses aren't, and that's totally fine. I love hobby businesses. Second thing is you could find a template online. There's some free ones, there's some paid for ones. My view on templates is that you can get 80% right in a template, but it's generally not in the 80% that's generic, is which is where the issues are lie. It's often the 20%, right? That's the stuff that's really uh, changes for your business. And I have seen mediations and disputes where people have used templates agreements online, some that they bought from reputable companies, but it doesn't deal with the real stuff. Because as I said earlier, I think the value in a shareholder's agreement is not the documents, it's the process to get there. So if you take a document, sign it, is it really worth the paper that it's written on? And then the last thing I say is, yeah, go to a lawyer, spend to do it properly. I mean, we charge between five and a half to, to 20,000 Rand if it's a big company. But at the simplest, you're looking at five and a half thousand Rand for simple shareholders agreements. Um, it's a fiat an investment in your company. With, and you need to balance that against what is, a sh what is a dispute with your shareholder gonna cost? What's it gonna cost to mediate, to fight that out? What's it gonna do to your business? What's the opportunity cost of stuff you could be working on when you're dealing with a shareholder dispute? So. You know, really, if you're balancing the investment now to the chaos and the expensive chaos that it can cause if something goes wrong, you know, I think it's a bargain personally, but I am a lawyer. Um, so that's my thoughts on whether you need a lawyer. My last thoughts on this, one last thing I want to add um, is firstly, for the first part, like for, the, for most companies, a shareholder agreement is going to be signed, locked in the safe, and never looked at again. And that's really your best case scenario, right? But you need it there in case something goes wrong. Because um, 
one of because I can tell you with your business, the likelihood is that things are something is going to go wrong at some point. It has for every other business in in history. It's probably for your business at some point, and that's fine. Things break, things go wrong. The important thing here, when things go wrong, is to have a mechanism and a playbook to follow, which I've stressed a million times here. As I've said again, the main benefit in is the discussion. You're not just agreeing, agreeing to a recording terms, but you're actually agreeing to these terms. Can't stress that enough. And the last point I want to say is make this document yours. Think about you and your business partners as a whole, your priorities, your weaknesses, your stuff that's going on, your financial situations. Make this document one that reflects your company. So that's all, folks. You know, we're going to leave some time for questions. Um, before I get to that, um, you know, what we've done here today is we looked at shareholders' agreements, we looked at how you get one, how you implement it, we looked at what goes into one, and I've shared my thoughts and feelings after doing probably hundreds of these documents. I don't know if you people uh, people here know that, but this webinar, this webinar is one of the loads that we've got. They loads up on our YouTube channel. I really recommend checking them out. They're all about 30 minutes to an hour, super interesting topics. We've also launched a podcast with some really interesting interviews with some entrepreneurs. Uh, we've got one on load shedding, which went kind of viral this weekend, which is quite exciting. People are sitting in the dark and Googling when load shedding end. We've got an episode with an energy expert talking about that. It's some of the interesting episodes. And I don't know if people know this, but our Legalese blog is packed with content that's really geared for, for business owners and people running business. Really interesting topics are, are written by lawyers, not by content generators. We certainly think, what do people need to know? And they're all on our blog, free for you to use. Um, that's it. That's Legalese. Uh, that's our, our webinar series. Um, and I'm uh, here to answer questions. I'm going to see if I can stop sharing my screen and get to the questions. If anyone's got any questions, um, I'd love to answer them. Let's have a look. No questions so far, which is also totally fine. Could be that I've dealt with it all perfectly. If anyone wants to slip out now, please feel free. Um, if anyone wants to ask questions, I'm here for that as well. Um, and I'll just sit here for a few minutes. Or unless it is clear that I've answered everything. Let's check the Q&A thing. Also nothing. That's fine. I'll wait to see maybe people are typing. Okay. That's great. If any of you people need to get hold of us, you know where to find us. If there's anything that you that you want to chat through with these shareholders agreements, um, you know, we're here for exactly that. And I think at this point, we can assume we don't have any questions, which is great. Thank you all so much for joining. Um, really interesting to do this presentation today. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you at the next one. Definitely check out our blog uh, where you can find some of the other um, some of the other webinars. I'm checking to see. Ah, we've got a question here. Great talk, very informative. Drop your mail. Great. Love to hear it. All righty. Thank you, everyone. I'm signing off. Everyone have a great day.